You probably hear me anyway, right? <laughs> Even without the microphone. <laughs> so welcome once again uh, to the Subcommittee of Higher Education and Workforce Investment. I note that a quorum is present. And uh, I also want to ask unanimous consent that Ms. Wilde of Pennsylvania be allowed to sit in with us today with the understanding that she will be able to ask questions after all members of the subcommittee have asked their questions and without objection so ordered. <clears throat> the committee in, is meeting today in a legislative hearing to hear testimony on the cost of non-completion, improving student outcomes in higher education. Pursuant to committee rule 7C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member and this allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today we will examine the importance of improving student outcomes in higher education. As this committee continues its work to expand college access, we must also ensure that today's students have the support they need to complete college and enjoy the life-changing benefits of a college degree. This is really a matter of national importance. The students enrolling in college today, students who are increasingly diverse, who have fewer financial resources, who are juggling work and family obligations, these students, our students, are the future of our economy. Research unequivocally shows that compared to high school graduates, College graduates are more financially stable, enjoy healthier lives, and are better able to pass on their success to future generations. The benefits of obtaining a college degree go far beyond individual gains. When more students earn degrees, we all benefit. I know you all agree with that. Increased degree attainment contributes to the economic health of our towns, our cities and states, and it reduces reliance on public safety net programs. It helps make our communities healthier and reduces rates of incarceration. Simply put, investments in quality higher education will pay for themselves. In fact, research have found that for every dollar a state invests in higher education, it receives up to $4.50 in return. The lasting, undeniable benefits of a college degree illustrate our responsibility as a nation to ensure that students have an opportunity to enroll in and graduate from college. However, the data shows us that there is a lot of work to do. Roughly only six out of every 10 students graduate with a degree. And the odds of graduating are worse if you are a student of color or a low-income student. Today, white students complete college degrees at one and a half times the rate of black students. Similarly, graduation rate gaps disadvantage low-income families. With Pell Grant recipients, 18 percentage points less likely to graduate than non-Pell recipients. These gaps do not reflect a lack of effort or desire on the part of students. They reflect the numerous barriers underserved students face throughout their educational careers. These challenges begin in K-12 education, where systemic inequities leave too many students unprepared for college coursework. And they are compounded by the challenges facing America's increasingly non-traditional student body. So today, more than one in three students enrolls part-time. One in every two students holds down a job while in college. A quarter of students care for children of their own. And more than 40% of students live in poverty. To reach graduation, these students need not only academic supports, but also wraparound services, like counseling, like childcare support, and assistance with food and housing, so they can focus on studies without sacrificing necessities. Congress has a responsibility to ensure that today's college students have the support they need to make it to graduation day. Otherwise, we will continue to leave far too many students without a degree, struggling with student loans that they can't repay. And in many cases, this burden and the emotional toll of not having completed college can set students further back than when they enrolled. 
We cannot sit idly while every day students across the country are forced to choose between their degree, their income, their children, and their health. Rather than splitting hairs about a one or a 2% increase in funding levels, we should take bold steps to invest in students, feeling secure in the knowledge that our investment will pay off as we see more Americans earning college degrees, filling high demand jobs, and giving back to their communities. Education, we know, has a tr transformative power and an unparalleled impact on intergenerational mobility, especially for those who rely on federal financial aid and federally funded student support programs. We must invest in higher education so that all students who begin college, no matter their race, their income, their background or circumstance, can complete a degree that leads to a rewarding career. I want to thank the witnesses for being with us today for this important discussion. And I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Smucker, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. Uh, it is graduation season. We, there's a lot to celebrate as we talk about higher education as well. Across the country, millions of students are celebrating themselves after years of hard work that they've dedicated to earning their degree. So finally, they have no more of those late-nighters, maybe even all-nighters in the library studying those flashcards at the periodic table or experiencing that dorm room uh, food. These students are on to bigger and better things. Uh, this is a reality for some, including, I'm happy to say, my oldest daughter, Paige, who will be walking uh, next week in celebration of her uh, graduation. Their achievement is cause for celebration. But going unseen are the millions of men and women who won't be graduating this month because they were unable to complete their degree. Part of the legacy of the Higher Education Act was making college accessible to more Americans. This objective on the whole was very successful. Between 1995 and 2005, university enrollment increased by 23 percent, followed by another 14 percent increase over the following decade. By 2015, approximately 20 million students were enrolled in post-secondary education. Enrolling in college, it's a personal and even emotional decision. And for many students, they may be the first in their family to pursue a post-secondary degree. Some may never have thought that college would be an option for them. By enrolling, they're taking a step in faith toward a better life and toward a better future. Just 58% of enrollees graduate in six years. That's, six, that's not four years, that's six years, only 58% in six years. And myself being a non-traditional student, if you factor in non-traditional students, those numbers can look even worse. Those numbers aren't, they're not okay. We cannot afford to be complacent about the fact that 42% of American students are unable to complete their education within six years because this means that many of these students are exiting programs with significant student loan debt to their name and without the value of that degree, hurting their ability to provide for themselves and for their families. A recent study by the Wall Street Journal found that when factoring in outstanding student loan debt, students who drop out before attaining a degree have worse financial outcomes than those who never pursue post-secondary education in the first place. There's always been a degree of risk involved in pursuing a college education, but student loan debt has upped the stakes to devastating levels for far too many students. Easy access to taxpayer-funded student loans has driven up post-secondary tuition and fees so that today, aggregate student loan debt stands at a staggering $1.5 trillion, and the number keeps growing. The absence of downward pressure on rising costs paired with the fact that post-secondary institutions do not share in the risk of students' non-completion has woefully harmed students' chances at future success. Whether a student sticks with the program or not, institutions continue to receive tax dollars uninterrupted. That needs to change. Institutions should must have a greater stake in their students' success and a reason to help spur them onto the finish line. Post-secondary education is a vital pathway to good paying jobs and career success. And we must work to ensure that this pathway remains available and viable to students of all ages and socioeconomic backgrounds. 
But getting these students to the starting line is not enough. We must encourage them to complete a program and earn that credential or degree. Across the country, we have more than 7 million unfilled jobs, and employers desperately need workers with the right skills and credentials to participate in the workforce and to drive our economy forward. Now, more than ever, we need solutions that align post-secondary education with in-demand jobs and give students in school a reason to finish their program. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. Without objection, all other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by five on May 22nd. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our witnesses. Dr. Susan uh, Dynarski is a professor of public policy, education, and economics at the University of Michigan and a faculty research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Dr. Dynarski's uh, research focuses on understanding and reducing inequality in education. Dr. Dynarski earned an AB in social studies from Harvard, a master's of public policy from Harvard, and a PhD in economics from MIT. Thank you for being with us. I'm pleased to recognize my colleague, uh, Representative Steve Cohn, to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Rudd, his constituent, who was appearing before us as a witness today. Thank you, Chair Davis and Chair Scott, for giving me the opportunity to introduce a distinguished resident of the city of Memphis. Dr. David Rudd is celebrating his fifth year as president of the University of Memphis this month. He came to the University of Memphis after uh, attending and graduating undergraduate at Princeton University, and then he went to the University of Texas, Austin, where he showed great promise and made the most important decision of his life, where he met and married Loretta Rudd, who has accompanied him to the University of Memphis, and she's a faculty member as well. Dr. Rudd was at the University of Utah before he came to, to Memphis and uh, was a professor there in psychology. He's, done, he's got a distinguished career as a psychologist. He's done much with veterans and trying to see that they get opportunities to get education. He's been a valuable resource to, the, to our city and uh, he was wise to send his son Nicholas to my alma mater, Vanderbilt, and he's just a phenomenal Memphian and I'm sure you'll learn much from his testimony. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Dr. Pam Edinger has been president of Bunker Hill Community College, the largest of 15 community colleges in Massachusetts since 2013. Dr. Edinger has served the community college movement for three decades in Massachusetts and in California, including 10 years as a college president. Dr. Edinger uh, earned a bachelor's degree in English from Barnard College and her master's and doctorate in Japanese literature from Columbia University. Welcome. Dr. Kyle Ethelbaugh is Director of Federal TRIO Programs at the University of Utah, where he oversees student support services and upward bound programs. Dr. Ethelbaugh has 22 years of professional higher education experience, including admissions, financial aid, academic advising and roles, and federal TRIO programs. Dr. Eth Mr. Ethelbaugh received a bachelor's degree in cultural and linguistic anthropology from the University of Arizona and a master's degree in public health from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Welcome as well. We appreciate all of you for being here and look forward to your testimony. I wanted to remind the witnesses that we have read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. I wanted to also remind you that pursuant to Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Section um, 1001, it is illegal to knowingly and willfully falsify any statement, representation, writing, document, or material fact presented to Congress or otherwise conceal or cover up a material fact. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it will turn on and the members can hear you. As you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green and after four minutes, the light will turn yellow to signal that you have one remaining minute. When the light turns red, your five minutes have expired and we ask that you please wrap up. We will let the entire panel make their presentations before we move to member questions and when answering a question, please remember to once again turn your microphone on. I'll first recognize now uh, Dr. Uh, Dynarski for, for your remarks, and then we'll go all the way through. Thank you. Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. A college degree is one of the best investments a person can make. My dad was a high school dropout. I'm a college professor. 
I have seen firsthand the power of education to change people's lives. A bachelor's degree pays for itself several times over in the form of higher income, lower unemployment, and increased economic security. College graduates with a BA earn 80% more than those with just a high school degree. Within 10 years of college graduation, the typical BA recipient will have recouped the cost of attending college. Those who attend college without graduating see much smaller benefits. Especially for men, the earnings of non-completers more closely resemble those of high school graduates than of college graduates. Rising student debt has shifted financial risk onto students and makes graduation even more important. Those who earn a BA rarely default on their loans. Most defaults are by non-completers. Now while college completion has, college attendance has risen steadily, degree attainment has stagnated. That's because half of college students drop out without earning a degree. As a result, only about 30% of adults have a BA. For those from the lowest income families, it's 10%. For black adults, it's 22%, and for Hispanic adults, it's 15%. Now, most people start college intending to earn a degree. Most do not succeed. The Department of Education projects a sharp increase in the number of college students who are black or Hispanic, while the number of white students will barely budge. Unless we increase completion rates for disadvantaged black and Latino students, we're looking at a sharp decrease in the education of our population. Now, completion rates vary dramatically by sector. The odds of graduating uh, if you start out at a nonprofit four year college are 76%, at a public four year college, 65%, at a community college, 37%, and at a for profit school, 35%. At hundreds of schools, only one out of five students will graduate. At 300 colleges, students are more likely to default in their student loans than they are to get a degree. The very low completion rates at for-profits are especially troubling. Students attending for-profits take on much higher debt and they're far more likely to default on their loans. That's because evidence shows that students don't get an earnings boost from attending a for-profit college. Now why do students drop out? Students with weaker academic preparation are more likely to drop out, unsurprisingly, but even well-prepared students drop out of college. For example, a high-performing student from a low-income family is no more likely to graduate college than a mediocre student from a high-income family. Part of this is financial insecurity. Students need to know that their college costs are covered in order to focus on their studies. Our complicated, bureaucratic financial aid system often fails them. Even more importantly, school quality matters. Better schools produce better outcomes. This is obvious when we're talking about K-12 education, which is free for students. Since it's free, we focus our policy discussions on how to make that free education a good education. For college, we are rightly concerned about affordability, and we talk about it quite a bit. But we can't stop there. An affordable school is worthless or even harmful if it doesn't provide a quality education. Evidence shows that resources matter for college completion, especially for disadvantaged students, yet those with the greatest needs attend the schools with the fewest resources. In elementary and secondary education, we steer additional money and support towards students with the greatest need. Federal money sends, uh, federal funding sends money to schools who teach English language learners, those with learning disabilities, and the economically disadvantaged. In college, the equation is flipped. Schools that are most students with the greatest need get the fewest resources. At private universities, per pupil instructional spending is about $45,000 a year. At community colleges, 10000 now we've got strong evidence about what works in increasing completion and unsurprisingly, it costs something. At the City University of New York, the ASAP program more than doubled the graduation rate of community college students, similar program in Ohio, similar success. These programs now serve tens of thousands of students. They cost a few thousand dollars per student per year, which still leaves community colleges spending far less than four-year colleges. Stable funding is critical for schools if they're to succeed. But when states face a budget crunch, it's typically the public colleges that get cut first. Spending on public colleges took a very hard hit during the recession. The result was decreased resources, higher tuition prices, and high dropout rates. Facing underfunded and overflowing public colleges, students turned in large numbers to for-profit colleges. They left those colleges with huge student debts and worthless credentials. This pattern is likely to, re to repeat itself with the next recession, unless we make a change. We will see another spike in for-profit enrollment, another spike in student loan default, unless we consistently give our public colleges the resources they need to educate our students.
Thank you very much. Dr. Rudd? Uh, Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, the challenges facing today's college students are well known with concerns about costs, student loan debt, and return on investment representing a recurring theme nationally. The University of Memphis has an important role to play in addressing these issues and ensuring our students can access an affordable, high quality education that prepares them for success both in a career and in life. Approximately half of our students are fully Pell eligible and roughly 44% are first generation students. In recent years, we've worked diligently to limit or eliminate tuition increases while also implementing a range of innovative programs that remove barriers and increase retention. Today, I'll share a few examples of those initiatives that have been most successful for our university and most importantly for our students. The majority of our students work significant hours outside of the classroom to pay for college costs and other expenses, and these, these work hours take students away from their studies and affect time to graduation. In 2016, the University of Memphis Foundation launched a private company called the UMRF Ventures. The single goal of this company was to create jobs that paid well enough so students could work fewer hours while also gaining meaningful work experience and allowing them to focus more specifically on school. Ventures now operates three high-performing call centers, a data analytics center, and an IT command center for some of the largest employers in Memphis, including FedEx, St. Jude, International Paper, and others. Today, it employs over 300 students with wages that range from $15 to $26 per hour, and we expect to hire more students in the very near future. Early data indicate that students who work for ventures are uniformly staying on track for graduation, primarily as a result of the ability to cap work hours and focus more intently on academic demands. I'd also like to share with you our Academic Coaching for Excellence program, which provides psychosocial support and related time management and organizational skills for students placed on academic warning. In the latest 2018 cohort, the retention rate for our ACE participants was 87.3% in sharp contrast to non-participants at 43.5% and almost equal to the general retention rate for the campus as a whole at 93%. Recognizing our institution as a significant population of male African-American students who have historically struggled with poor retention rates, we launched the Memphis Advantage Scholarship Program to provide targeted scholarship dollars and mentor support for those students. As a result, six-year graduation rates have more than doubled from 28.5% to 58.1% for those receiving support, and we have significant effort underway to expand the Memphis Advantage program uh, for the university as a whole. Additionally, the University of Memphis recently opened an office of first-generation students to provide consolidated and coordinated delivery of a range of mentorship for our students, including leadership and support programs broadly for first-generation students. We've also established a finish line program that helps students who stopped out at the U of M with 90 or more hours complete their degree. The average cost for those students to complete is less than $2,000 and the average number of hours required to complete is actually less than 12. It is remarkable that students that may have been out for a decade are able to complete that quickly. Our sustained focus on supporting our most vulnerable students demonstrates several things. First, addressing financial challenges Containing costs are critical for student success. Second, the psychosocial support has a remarkable impact on students' ability to excel academically. Third, simple things make a big difference for retention and degree completion. We've discovered that it's not just about academic capacity for our students, it's about support. And that support takes form both in financial and psychosocial ways. Finally, our most vulnerable students can achieve at high levels with limited but focused institutional support. Once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today. I hope that the initiatives I've described will inform as you explore federal policies that could further support student success and improve our nation's graduation rates for all of our students, regardless of race, background, or life circumstance. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Dr. Edinger. 
Thank you, Chair Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to brief you on the uh, pressing issues of degree completion, its implications for our future workforce, and solutions we're implementing at Bunker Hill Community College. Bunker Hill is a mid-sized urban institution in Boston, serving 18,000 students a year from the metro area and a number of gateway cities. Community colleges educate over 13 million students, one out of every two undergraduates in the United States. Middle and low income students are most likely to attend community colleges than any other type of higher education institution. We're the source of the future workforce, performing what we call new collar jobs, jobs that are middle skills requiring some college and pays well. Jobs in IT, in STEM, healthcare, manufacturing, and the creative economy driven by the expansion of gaming and artificial intelligence. In Massachusetts alone, 65,000 middle skills jobs are needed uh, or will be created by the beginning of the next decade. 80% of the jobs created now will require some college. But our enrollments are not trending to meet this need. Our high school population will drop precipitously in five years and fewer college grads will reach the workplace. Our hope of filling these new college jobs lies in educating our adult learners who are becoming the majority at our community colleges. Degree completion in two or even three years has always been a challenge for community college students and now even more so with adult students. The first challenge is financial and social. College is not at the center of adult learners' lives. Three out of four work, three out of five are parents, 77% of them earn at the lowest two quintile of income. They're often one small financial disaster away from dropping out. They're financially fragile, but they know that college leads to economic and social mobility. A majority of the students who drop out that we've studied were in good standing. 60% had a 2.5 GPA, that's a B plus. And 40% have finished over a year's worth of classes. The pressures of basic needs, housing, food, transportation, and childcare are what derails these students, not academic performance. Over 50% of students experience food insecurity on our campus, 14% were homeless, and this is ubiquitous across the community colleges in the United States. So Bunker Hill's immediate answer was to open a food pantry to raise funds for public transportation passes, to advocate for alignment of social benefits like SNAP with needs of the adult college student. Additionally, open educational resource available online to replace traditional textbooks saved approximately $1.5 million for our students since the beginning of the program in 2016. The second challenge is academic preparation. 90% of entering students need developmental math, 45% are below college level in English. We used to call developmental education or dev ed the revolving front door. The longer you stay in dev ed, the more likely you are to drop out. So we compressed and accelerated it. You can take math and English um, courses two levels at a time and with tutoring services available. Um, it's counterintuitive, but students did better and now they can do all of their dev ed work in one year. We're working on the same sequences for English as a second language. The third challenge is to map the shortest pathway to employment. This requires industry-aligned curriculum, apprenticeships, and internships from our business partners. We need certificates that stacks towards the degree. We need fully paid experiential learning opportunities with transportation stipends. The best retention strategy is a promised job at the end of the line. The final challenge is for institutions like ours and others to shift from the traditional college paradigm to retain and graduate every adult learner. We must craft policies and procedures, schedules and services and mindsets that respects the complex life of our students and then cater to it. Bunker Hill used to offer midnight classes to accommodate workers on the second shift. Now we offer hybrid and online classes for the same reasons. Meet these challenges and they will complete. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Ethabaugh. Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Smucker, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kyle Ethelbaugh, and I serve as the Director of TRIO Student Support Services and TRIO Upward Bound Programs at the University of Utah. In total, I have 22 years of professional experience in higher education, 
mostly directing TRIO programs. I'm also on the incoming board chair of the Council for, the Op for Opportunity in Education, which promotes college access and success for low-income first-generation students and students with disabilities. Questions surrounding college completion for individuals from underrepresented groups are deeply personal for me. I'm a full-blooded white Mount Apache from the Fort Apache Indian Reservation in central eastern Arizona. I was raised along with my only brother by my grandmother, who was a product of the Indian boarding school system. Although my grandmother's boarding school experience wasn't positive for her, she wanted us to be a part of something larger, and she knew that education would be the entry, entry point into that something larger that she envisioned. However, neither she nor any of my other family members possessed the social or cultural capital to assist me in the college application process or to sustain me once I enrolled. There were no college graduates in my family. Adding to this lack of knowledge was the trauma of poverty that defined our lives growing up on the reservation. I was raised by my grandmother because I had lost my mother to, the, to, to domestic violence when I was a child. My father was absent from my life as he was in prison and he later passed away from alcoholism. My only brother later committed suicide as a result of his experiences, which were not all too different from my own. The only difference of all of this was that I was given the opportunity of education. Having been raised in that environment, I was unsure of my own academic abilities and intimidated by the ever-present challenges of life on the reservation. However, through the TRIO programs, I found, that the hands, I found the hands that reached out to me, the ones I ultimately took hold of and did not let go. With the help of Upward Bound, I enrolled at the University of Arizona with the assistance of the University's TRIO Student Support Services Program, or SSS. I graduated with my Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology. Through SSS, I received coaching around many decisions that seemed inconsequential at the time, in addition to the academic support I was already receiving. But for me, and low-income first-generation students like me, such advising made a critical difference. For example, during my freshman year, my TRIO advisor urged me to transition from a job off campus at the local mall to a campus-based work-study position so that I could stay closer to the TRIO office, the library, and my peers. My new job in the admissions office helped solidify my identity and confidence as a student, while also sparking the passion that has fueled my career for the last 22 years. My experience as a TRIO student inform how I approach my work today as a TRIO director. The emphasis on non-cognitive factors, a sense of belonging, leadership, and self-efficacy were the very things that kept me connected to and remaining in college. As a result, I work to ensure that the programs I oversee provide comprehensive academic, social, and cultural supportive services with measurable outcomes. As a Research One institution, the University of Utah recruits high caliber students. However, low income first generation students who don't have the benefit of the supportive services provided by TRIO are only about half as likely as their peers to graduate within six years, 33% versus 60%. This is consistent with the national experience. I know that TRIO Student Support Services makes a difference in college completion. At the University of Utah, TRIO SSS raises graduation rates for low-income, first-generation students by 42%. Nationally, it raises six-year graduation rates at four-year institutions by 20%, and the four-year graduation rates at two-year institutions by 46%. At the University of Utah, we've accomplished this by instituting several practices that are grounded in research, our institutional experiences, and observations about what helps the most vulnerable students succeed. For example, our SSS program partners with the Office of Continuing Education and the math department to offer preparatory courses each semester to help students meet their curricular requirements. Otherwise, students would have to venture off campus to take a similar course at the local community college. Additionally, as the University of Utah is primarily a commuter campus, we maintain both one-on-one, -on -one, in-person, and online tutoring options in order to meet fully the students' needs. This is a mere sample of the work we do. As stewards of federal dollars, my TRIO colleagues and I understand that we must ensure that the programs we deliver are robust, replicable, and impactful. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. And thank you all for staying in, in the time limits. Under Committee Rule 8A, we will now question witnesses under the five-minute rule on his chair. I'll start and we'll be followed by the ranking member and then we'll alternate between the parties. Um, Mr. Ethelbaugh, I wanted to just start and thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, you really have provided us with a compelling example of the transformative power of education. I want to thank you for that. Could you go into a, a little more detail perhaps about the TRIO program? I know you've, you've helped us understand um, 
some of, of the programs that really made a difference from you, but I want to ask you about one of the more unique components uh, of, of TRIO that leads students to gain the confidence and the inspiration that they might not otherwise have. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, Th uh, thank you, Chairwoman um, Davis. In addition to the academic support that TRIO provides, uh, one thing that has always been consistent with the programs um, overall, which are uh, intended to serve low-income first-generation and disabled students to access and complete post-secondary education, is the constant structure for the development of non-cognitive variables. And this is only something that has recently been a topic of conversation and research within higher education. So within my programs, for example, in addition to the academic support like tutoring and academic advising, I also received um, workshop environments that provided support for my development in just general everyday cultural activities that I had not experienced before. How to do resumes, how to interview for jobs, how to really be a part of the, the, the rooms and the environments that I had not previously been privy to. And this is something that I constantly tell our students is, and I have spoken to our students in our last graduation, which was last week, and mentioned to them that they're gonna find themselves in places they don't, do not belong. And the reason I say that is because I am in a place I do not belong. When you look at federal Indian policy, I'm not supposed to be here, yet I'm here. And this is the power of education. <laughs> The power of education and the belief that is attendant within the individuals who support you is very much paramount in providing the support that we need. So there's none of us that has come to where we are merely on our own. We've all had support systems, and TRIO has that in terms of adding to the mm -hmm. um, academic supports, but also Could, these could you also speak, Mr. Ethelbaugh, as you know, we're all kind of limited in our time, and, uh, about the, the intergenerational impact. Uh, that this has on families and communities. I mean, what that, that giving back to the community that people are more uh, likely to be able to do. How did how did you see that in your situation and with other students that you have? Well, I don't have any children, but if I did have children, they would not be low income and they would not be first generation. So within one generation, one generation removed from being a participant in TRIO programs, we've already knocked out the generational, the intergenerational form of poverty that exists within these communities. In addition, I used to oversee um, educational opportunity centers and talent search programs in the Las Vegas area. And within those environments, we worked with adults to also complete education, to um, enter and complete high school education and then enter post-secondary. And on a number of occasions, we had the full family that actually entered the programs. We had a mother and daughter one year who graduated together, the mother with a bachelor's degree and the daughter with her bachelor's degree because we had the daughter in our Upward Bound program and the mother in our EOC. So just the, the vision of seeing someone in their family, someone familiar, someone they can recognize them, and somebody who knows them mm -hmm. has had a tremendous impact on the ability for others to see themselves in that place as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I know we also, have uh, people who work um, with TRIO students, um, wonderful counselors to help students um, you know, see what they ordinarily would not be able uh, to be, that you can't be what you can't see. And so they're helping with that. But I'm also wondering about particular training um, that they have that might make that difference. Because uh, not everybody does, can do this job. Right. No, no. Um, the individuals that we seek to fill these positions primarily come from areas and what we look for are area that have areas within psychology, sociology, social work, as well as education. In addition, what we provide within the job itself is um, access to professional development opportunities wherein they'll get these connections to these industries that provide the foundational support for some of these things that they might be addressing. For example, we've partnered with different community agencies within Salt Lake City to make sure that our students are aware of, or our staff is aware of, the needs of adolescent minds, the adolescent brain in terms of um, undergoing stress and how to deal with the impact of just change that's occurring within their lives, let alone adding that traumatic experience like college education, because it is a traumatic experience 
going from one environment to a completely different one. So yeah. how do you measure that? And that's really the opportunities that we try to, to put. Thank um, you very much. And to all of you, it's difficult to go back and forth. Sometimes I know that everybody's going to have questions for, for the rest. Uh, thank you. Mr. Smucker, please uh, have your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Rudd, I'd l like to uh, get your opinion on a proposal that we had uh, included uh, in the uh, HEA reform bill last session, but it also was proposed by the uh, by President Obama and his administration. It would be essentially a Pell bonus to students who are enrolled in enough credits uh, to graduate on time, 30 credits uh, per award year. Do you think that policy proposal could be an effective tool to increase on-time completion rates? I, I do, and I think a lot of the evidence that, that we have demonstrated, uh, it, it's usually small amounts of money that make a big difference. So if you look at uh, the scholarshiping that we created uh, that specifically moved our African-American male graduation rate for those that participated with the scholarship, uh, doubled it. Uh, the average cost of that was $4,000 per individual. So relatively small amounts of money can make very significant difference. I would, I would agree with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ethelbaugh, I really appreciate your story. I can relate. I was the first in my family to graduate from high school. Uh, and when I talked about higher uh, education beyond that, uh, and I, as I mentioned, I, was a non I ended up being a non-traditional college student attending at night while I was operating a business during the day. But I had no idea uh, uh, how to access uh, college. I was fortunate to have a loving parents and a great family, but just simply did not place the value on education uh, in, in a way that uh, I was able to experience. But uh, one barrier that we hear a lot about is trying to fill out the FAFSA uh, form, and I've had the opportunity to do that with my own daughters and have uh, seen the sometimes difficult or the complication of that form. So I guess I'd like to hear from you the effect that this form has, the, whether you think it's complicated, the effect that it has on the student population that you work with, and, and would simplifying the form, what would that mean to low-income students and their families? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Smucker. Um, the FAFSA in general, I think, has gotten a lot easier to maneuver, but there's still room for improvement. Uh, I think uh, simplifying that would definitely be a good step in, in helping to provide more access to individuals who might be applying. Uh, additionally, though, once the FAFSA is actually submitted, the process for verification has become the other bureaucratic component that tends to impede individuals' um, ability just to move forward in college education. So I think that's another area that we can look to address more. And that would be a look at the regulations in terms of what is required to prove that the information they submitted on the FAFSA is actually accurate and, and, and true. Yeah. Thank you. We, we look forward to working on that together. Uh, Dr. Dynarski, uh, we've spoken about uh, the need for college education or for some education for a lot of the jobs that are being created today. There's a Georgetown Center on Education Workforce estimated that over 95% of the jobs that have been created since the recession have been filled with those uh, with at least some college education. Um, we've also been a proponent here, I think, in a bipartisan way of looking at other pathways to careers. They may not all require a baccalaureate degree, um, but also I think it's increasingly important that students receive some form of post-secondary education. Um, so I guess I'd like to get your uh, reaction to that. Um, do students with some college uh, have the potential for an increase in earnings potential? And as you look at the jobs that will be created in the next decade or so, uh, what will the requirements be? Thank you for your question. Um, uh, the some college category sort of lumps in everything that's not a BA, and that could include anything from an AA degree uh, in, you know, in, health, in healthcare uh, or a certificate or just some credits. And um, each of those has a different payoff. So the evidence indicates that the payoff to uh, an AA degree, especially one that's in the sciences and the STEM fields, is, is quite consistently high. Um, AAs in academic fields don't tend to um, pay a whole lot. Um, certificates, the evidence is very mixed. Um, certificates are, are largely unregulated. 
you know, while degree programs have to go through an accreditation process, a certificate is pretty much whatever an institution calls a certificate. And they can range in length from a few courses to a couple of years. What we see is that the payoff to them tends to go up the longer that they are. Um, uh, except in for-profit colleges where the payoff to a certificate is essentially zero. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Edinger, I'm out of time. I was going to ask you a similar question, so hopefully you have a chance to address uh, that intersection with the education and workforce as a response to future questions. Of course. With, with the focus on, um, on adults, it is important for us to be able to chunk out the, um, the, the, the educational experience because they need to go in and out of the workforce while they work and support a family. And hopefully after they get the, their initial stack, the employer will be willing to pay for the rest of their education. So I think we, we can do that, and I think it's useful, but we have to be mindful that whatever we stack on top, abhorrable, so that when my students transfer to Dr. Rudd, they don't lose anything in that mm -hmm. process. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Mr. Takano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Smucker. Uh, we all know that financial, the financial benefits to completing a college degree, um, let there be no doubt that, that there is value in that. Uh, we also know that uh, students are struggling to afford more than just tuition, and that there are significant barriers uh, to students completing their education in a timely manner. In December 2018, the GAO uh, released a report examining the issue of food insecurity among college students. And I've met with students from my district and across California that have been calling on Congress to figure out how to address their basic needs uh, that include access to food, nutrition, and affordable housing. And if so many of our students uh, that I taught uh, during my 24 years of public, as a public school teacher uh, had a need to access for free or reduced school lunch, we can't assume that as they enter the, uh, the university system uh, that they're going to have any less need <laughs> for nutrition uh, and to assume that that's going to magically disappear when they turn 18. Um, it, it, I think is also a kind of a magical thinking. Um, I personally have visited uh, a food pantry on one of the community college campuses uh, that I used to be in my purview as a community college trustee at Norco College, and I was shocked uh, that uh, they said this is what the students said they needed. Uh, the, the California State University System has a basic needs initiative that focuses on the well-being of students in and out of class. All of their 23 campuses have a food bank uh, or a food distribution program. And I was, when I met with the statewide chancellor, uh, he told me about students living in cars. And I met with students from Berkeley who said they have to go way, way, way uh, out of, uh, in the, uh, a long radius from the campus to get affordable housing. Um, and that drive time also, you know, that's gonna affect their ability to be good students. In addition to maybe having to work, uh, this is all adding up to uh, I think endangering their ability to graduate on time. Across the country, there are emergency aid programs available on a college by college, state by state base basis, but we need to suss out what Congress can do uh, to remove or lessen these barriers because um, it's only gonna increase their likelihood of defaulting um, and uh, that's only gonna be, I think, an inefficient use of taxpayer money uh, unless we help these students uh, graduate on time. Dr. Edinger, what should a basic needs or completion grant program in HEA look like on a larger scale? Um, we, we can't food pantry our way out of this problem. That is a philanthropic patch. All of us have it. It is not permanent, not sustainable. I think part of it is to index, um, when we index need for students, we have to account for the total cost of education versus just tuition and fees. So the unmet needs per student on my campus is about $5,000, and that's the food and housing and childcare and the transportation. So somehow in um, not only indexing Pell to um, inflation, but also indexing it to the need for, for basic needs and make that part of the calculation, I think that's really important. The other is to align the policies for Pell, for, for students who are on Pell, with programs like SNAP, so that work requirements can be substituted by study requirements. So the students have the leisure then to be able to, um, to study with funds. Um, it is a policy issue. It is a long-term policy issue. 
Well, thank you. Uh, I, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, uh, when I went to an elite private school, uh, the financial aid package uh, was based on the total cost of education. And the grant was, you know, there was a, there was a combination of grant, uh, work study, uh, a, a, you know, the, the, all the elements. So there was personal responsibility involved, but it was also a realistic picture of what it takes to get through uh, a four-year program. So should we be thinking of a federal state partnership? What role should each entity have? Do you have, have your thoughts on that? I'm hoping no one from Massachusetts is in the room. Um, <laughs> I, I think it needs to be a partnership. Um, I know that in California, Cal Grants and, um, and, and, and the Pell Grant work together um, so that students can um, use the Pell Grant for living expenses and a lot of the Cal Grants for, um, for tuition and fees. I think there needs to be an alignment and an agreement between federal and state um, implementations so that it is not always a juggling act between the two. Um, maybe it's a matching program, maybe it's a percentage program. Um, there has not been a whole lot of conversation, um, at least that I know of, that, that is really helping us. So that might be one of the things to move Looks into. Looks like we have a lot of work to do in terms of uh, imagining and creating. I, I, my time is up and I, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Guthrie. Thank you. Thank you for having this hearing and thanks for everybody being here today. Uh, Dr. Rudd, uh, uh, first a question uh, for you. I actually grew up in a area where Memphis was our big city, so one of our big cities we went to kind of between Memphis, Nashville, and Birmingham, and so I uh, have a lot of affection for your university. So, uh, um, and Dr. Rudd, in your, in your testimony, you mentioned the importance of academic coaching, and speaking of coaching, we appreciate Coach Cal Perry as well, so I'm in Kentucky now, um, to improve student outcomes. Currently, the federal government has ineffective entrance and exit counseling process for recipients of student aid. This is why I introduced with uh, Suzanne Bonamici the Empowering Students Through Enhanced Financial Counseling Act, which will require more detailed and annual counseling for federal aid recipients throughout their education to ensure students are fully aware of their financial responsibilities. So having said that, so on finance, just making sure people fully understand, we hear people say, I thought I was getting a grant, but I was getting a loan. I don't have to pay it back. You have a lot of, I don't know if it was hearing what you wanted to hear when you signed up for the, the student aid or, or if it was just misinformation or they just didn't try to find, understand. So my question is, what recommendations do, you ha recommendations do you have for Congress to improve the financial counseling process? Well, I think students need to understand very specifically what the, you know, what the, the guidelines are, what they're borrowing and, and what the payment structure lo looks like and understand what that means over the long term. And I don't know that students understand that uh, specifically when money is borrowed um, and, and what the payment structure might be over the long term. I, I do agree that, that more assistance is needed on that front. The other thing you know, that, that I think is interesting, we've discovered that uh, if you look at advising, it's not just advising about the financial, uh, con the, the financial consequences for a student, but it's advising around, around course structure and what you take. Most students change their major. What happens for Pell students is they'll take a course, retake a course that they have failed. Eventually, they'll expend their loan capacity, get to the end of their loan capacity, and not be able to finish. If you look at the finish line program, what we were doing for a lot of those students is helping them complete once they've exhausted their loan capacity because they haven't been advised well on what course structure works best within a sequence. So it really is twofold. I mean, there's local advising and then there's financial advising. I think both of those really need to go hand in hand. Okay. And I know a lot of our student debt issue are, are students who just don't complete, but uh, and they get they have debt, but they don't have the degree to help pay them off. And sometimes it's people getting in fields that are uh, not as able to pay it back and not, not, not as a, in a investment risk reward or investment. So uh, University of Memphis Research Foundation ventures the program. I'm impressed with how it's helping students gain work experience in a relevant field while decreasing their work hours, improving career pathways. How could this program be used as a model at other institutions? Well, I think it. I think it easily could be used as a model. You look at local. Uh, you look at local workforce needs. This is a great example uh, of local companies that that high, have a high need. Uh, if you look, Memphis is a great example. There are arguably fifteen to sixteen thousand unfilled jobs, um, and it provides a pathway for those students to get to get practical experience while they're in school work for a reasonable wage that lowers the demand for them to work 
30 plus hours, they can reduce that to 20 plus hours, focus on academics, move through, uh, and ultimately move toward a graduation in a more reasonable uh, way, but also get great experience with that company. I mean, of the, of the ventures program, of those students that have worked in these, for these different companies, each of the graduates that we've had over the course of the first two years have gone on to, to work full time for those companies. And they have loved that. It has created a wonderful pathway, but one that benefits the student from the very beginning. Thank you. And Dr. Edinger, I see you shaking your head. You, Bunker Hill has a similar program. And yeah. could you explain what you guys do to create pathways for students to in apprenticeship opportunities? Yeah, we do. We, we have a learn and earn programs. Uh, and over the last three or four years, we've run about 450 students through it. First time, no corporate experience. They come back and they're ready. Um, it, and it does pay a, um, a decent wage. It pays $15 an hour and transportation, which is key to part of the urban environment. Um, we find that it's very useful. Um, and it doesn't really even matter what feel that they're getting ex their experiences. It's being immersed in the workplace. So, so I, I love the idea of, of that program. And um, in terms of the counseling, it is really uh, assisting the students to map out what they're going to do in two years or four years if they transfer and, and, uh, and helping them sort of navigate those narrower lanes rather than letting them wander everywhere. So that has been useful for us. Well, thank you very much, and my time's expired, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ayapal. Thank you, Chairwoman Davis, and thank you all for your excellent testimony. Um, I do have a College for All bill that I think addresses many of the issues that we're talking about, including it includes federal-state partnerships, uh, it includes um, addressing the total cost of education, and it includes the enormous burdens of, of student debt that are racking our country and making it so unaffordable. I think listening to your testimony and from everything I've heard from my constituents, what occurs to me all the time is that whether or not you complete has nothing to do or very little to do with your academic ability. It has so much to do with what supports and services you are able to get and the financial burdens that are placed um, on people. Uh, Last week, Temple University released the results of a survey indicating that 45% of student respondents from over 100 institutions said that they had been food insecure in the past 30 days. Kind of a stunning statistic. Um, and I think the data shows that students are not completing their degrees because of these severe financial struggles. Um, I would argue that a federal investment to ensure students can graduate debt-free is the key solution to this massive problem. But let's go to some specifics. Dr. Dynarski, in your written testimony, you state that because rising student debt has shifted financial risk onto students, graduation from college is even more important today than it was previously. Can you just say a little bit more about what you mean by that? If you look at default rates, so who is defaulting on student loans, it's not the college graduates. It's not the people who get a BA. It's overwhelmingly people who just got a few credits um, of schooling, exited with only perhaps $5,000 in debt, but because they got very little schooling uh, in, the, in the course of, of, of getting that debt, they are unable to support the, the um, expenses. Um, and the consequences of this, of defaulting on even a small loan, are quite severe. So having um, a default on your credit record means that when landlords check credit records, as they do, you're denied housing. Uh, many employers now check credit records. It can affect your employability. Uh, so uh, th there is, it, makes, it makes credit cards more expensive. It makes car loans more expensive. So it has a real hit on people's um, financial well-being when they go into default, and it's more likely if they don't complete. And it really affects the entirety of your life, not just your education loan. Um, you also discuss how degree completion varies by sector, with for-profit colleges having the lowest completion rates by far. As a whole, is the for-profit sector paying off for students? The best evidence we have indicates that uh, for-profit students do not benefit from their educations. Community college students do, students at public four-year colleges do, at um, private nonprofit colleges do, but the evidence is that um, students come out of the for-profits making the same as they did when they went in, and you, um, which you, tends to be very low uh, You wages. cite, can you just cite the statistic um, from, is it Cellini and Turner that you put into your She's into. right behind you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so students get no earnings boost from attending a for-profit college. Is that's that, correct. Is that correct? That's the statistic. Okay. No, none. 
Yes. Okay. So Dr. Edinger, let me turn to you, um, and thank you for your holistic approach that you described. Um, an education department survey showed that financial troubles, family responsibilities, and personal issues were the top reasons cited by students for dropping out of college, not academic problems. Does that comport with the conversations that you have had with your students at, at Bunker Hill Community College? Y yes, it does. Um, we have, when we looked at a cohort of students who have dropped out, as I noted earlier, um, they had B, B minus averages, and they were, um, they have completed close to 10 classes, and that's a lot of classes. These are committed students. So part of our struggle is to um, try to get them back. Mm -hmm. So our students sometimes come, come back after a year, they come back after two years, they come back after three years. They are tenacious. It's just that they don't have the path forward sometimes and the resources. Dr. Uh, Mr. Ethelbaugh, thank you so much for your very moving testimony and just for sharing your story. I think it's so important. Can you speak a little bit um, to your experience of how low-income students and students of color in particular are affected by the increasing costs of post-secondary education, either in terms of starting or in terms of, of completion? Oh, yeah, yes, thank you for your question. I think this impacts uh, this community and this population a lot more in, in that there's a lot more expectation put on this population to go forward and succeed regarding and in light of everything else. One thing that I generally tend to see though with the population that we serve is what we call front loading in the industry. When you receive financial aid, there's a lot more focus on your first two years to get financial aid in terms of non-federal dollars. And so um, our institution has started to look at that a little bit more closely in that we can provide more supportive services so once they get to their junior and senior years rather than in their first two years where, where we tend to see the students having not so much of a difficult time but toward the end where they do. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on to our, to our next question. Uh, Mr. Vonick. Thank you, Chairwoman Davis. I wanted to put an exclamation point on uh, my colleague Ms. Jayapal's comments. Um, we are facing historic student loan uh, debt, $1.5 trillion in total, and I strongly believe that one of the keys to tackling this is increasing college completion rates uh, because students are more likely to be able to fulfill that repayment structure if they, in fact, graduate with the degree for which they took the student loan out. Um, so thanks for that line of questioning. My question is for uh, Dr. Rudd and Dr. Edinger as um, college presidents. Can you talk about the challenges for students who transfer from one institution to another uh, and the risks uh, that are a result of that in some cases when it comes to completion? And what are best practices to avoid some of those risks? Dr. Edinger, why don't you go first? Sure. From the point of view of community colleges, we have always fought the issue of brand, right? Community college in the past have never been, uh, have been the stepchildren of, of the educational um, pathway. And even though some of our adjuncts would teach at four-year colleges teaching the same material, when it comes to acceptance of credits, um, they're not. My math credits are accepted at MIT, but they're not accepted at the state universities. It, it's random, it is subjective, and I think unless we have a, a good process of alignment, our students will continue to um, repeat courses over and over again. Dr. Rudd. Yeah, I would agree. I think that, that good, clear articulation agreements are needed. Uh, we have, I think, uh, would argue in Tennessee that we have very good specific articulation agreements. Um, I do think the other risk, though, that is related to that, particularly in the STEM areas, is that um, the question of whether or not the, the early preliminary courses in some areas prepare the student well for advanced level courses at the university level. Um, the response to that is really to have faculty uh, work together around the development of the curriculum from the four-year university to the community college uh, in the two-year location, and we do that. So I think we have had some good solutions to that problem. Uh, and, and made sure that students that were going to pursue uh, computer science were wear prepared or they were in math or another STEM area that they were wear prepared for advanced courses once they moved on to the university. 
Um, I appreciate your comments, Dr. Edinger, on the importance of community colleges. Um, they are exceptional institutions in my district. I think of Adirondack Community College, which has been extraordinarily successful, or Jefferson Community College. Um, my next question is on how can we reform federal work-study programs so that more students are able to work in jobs that are related to their careers and their academic courses of study? Because I think particularly for non-traditional students who we know are working at the same time as they are taking courses, we want to make sure that that employment experience helps with their academic work because I think that will help us address this completion rate issue. Uh, Dr. Rudd, why don't you go first? I, you know, I would say to really explore and look at alternatives about partnering with some of the corporate programs like the ones we've developed. I mean, we have wonderful corporate partners, but they are restricted in the capacity to look at work-study funding uh, to create some flexibility and options for partnering uh, as a part of it. The majority of, of those opportunities that we have are private opportunities, but to find a way to leverage federal dollars for other dollars in the community and really expand that base. I mean, we could very quickly expand the work opportunities that we provided for students if we had some flexibility in how those funds were expended. Dr. Edinger? Um, we can also use the system to reinforce the academic rigor of what they do. We have students who use work study to serve as peer mentors or to serve as tutors um, so that they, they, they are role models for the students coming up. So that, that particular identity and social contract between them um, actually promotes retention. So I, I would agree that, that they need to be tied tighter. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Levin. Thank you, Chairwoman Davis. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, I, I'm uh, maybe the, I don't know, the only member of Congress who used to run a, a state workforce system and worked with the community colleges and universities. Uh, we, just, we ended up uh, creating a program called No Worker Left Behind during the auto implosion and the industry implosion, the Great Recession in Michigan, which put 162,000 uh, workers back to school to study for in-demand jobs. And I think partly due to Professor Donarski's research, we found out that about 120,000 of them got jobs related to their training. But this issue of completion and its intersection with with uh, the workers sort of live lives and the cost of college was a huge problem. Uh, in your testimony, Dr. Donarski, you shared data demonstrating of, about how different di uh, institutions have uh, very different graduation rates. Uh, and it's clear that from your research or the research you cited that the student's likelihood of success is greatly impacted by which kind of institution they attend. So can you unpack a little more how the high cost of college impacts where students, low-income students enroll and how it, this affects college completion? Like what, so, what's really going on here for, for these poorer students? Low-income students are concentrated in the community colleges uh, and in the non-selective um, four-year public colleges and in the for-profit schools. Um, uh, as I um, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, the universities, the, the elite universities in our country, uh, per student expenditure is $40,000 per year right. on, an, on instruction, 10000 for a community college. So they're in the places where the least money is being spent, and they tend to have the highest needs. Um, they also, uh, the community colleges um, have traditionally been the access institutions with the lowest prices, and that's another reason that, that um, uh, disadvantaged students are attracted to them. And then so many uh, uh, low-income students end up working long hours, often at multiple jobs, just to make ends meet while they're trying to be in school. Dr. Edinger, what impact do these long hours have on students' abilities to complete in a timely fashion? And, and Dr. Rudd, if you also want to comment on that, I'd appreciate it. I think the issue is pure mathematics. In order to... Um, take five classes, which is the full load, so you can finish in two years, that takes up 45 hours a week of studying and being in class. Mm -hmm. So whatever else that you can squeeze in there um, is the quality of what you would get. Um, so so there, there's a very clear correlation just in time alone, uh, much less taking care of children and, and you know going to doctors and fixing your cars and all of those other pieces. Um, it's time and it's money. If, if we are able to give students that $4,500 to $5,000 that they are in need, each one of my students who are on Pell Grant are short that much money, um, they cannot work as much. Then they can go to class. 45 hours a week is a lot of time 
that they're not having in those classrooms. Yeah, I would agree completely. Every single intervention that we've done that lowered work demands, that lowered the number of outside hours they had to had to work, improved performance and time to graduation. Uh, we've not had a single effort in that area that hasn't improved time to graduation. Thank you. You know, in I mean, no worker left behind. It, it was complex, but basically, we gave people up to ten thousand dollars of free tuition at any community college, university, or other approved training program plus childcare and transportation. And people said, we did not give people a stipend, you know, but we had a waiting list in all 83 of Michigan's counties, and people found a way to make it work when we gave them some real money to go study. Um, let, me, let me just a ask you, uh, Dr. Donarski, because you've talked about the for-profits. Um, why are our completion rates there so low, and what can we do about it as policymakers? I think the, the for-profits show, you know, have great promise and that they could be a, um, a, a locus for innovation, for testing new, um, new approaches. Um, uh, that would require that we not only let them innovate, but that we hold them accountable for their, for their outcomes, and it's that part of the equation that's been missing. Uh, so, um, we have not been regulating and providing oversights to the for-profits in a robust manner. Um, it hasn't happened. Uh, and the results of that fall on students who end up not graduating or if they graduate with a, de with a degree that isn't worth anything. So it's a failure of public policy, I would say, that the graduation rates are low and that for-profit students end up with such high debt loads. Uh, and end up defaulting. And so we can't treat all educational institutions the same, you're saying. We'd have to, you know, have accountability measures for nonprofits that would hold them specifically accountable. I think we need to have accountability measures that we actually enforce, and that's what we have not okay. been doing. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Mr. Timmons. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chairwoman. I yield my time to Dr. Fox. I thank the gentleman from doing that, for doing that, and I thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Dr. Dynarski, earlier this year, the Wall Street Journal published an article on dual enrollment courses, which are college level classes taken in high school that fulfill both high school and college credit requirements. And I haven't heard any of you mention that as a, an alternative for many students. But the author of the story cited a study by the University of Texas system that found students who took dual credit courses in high school were three times more likely to graduate college than their peers who did not take any dual enrollment courses. Are you aware of any other states or institutions that have seen similar results implementing concurrent enrollment? And what do these results mean for schools and policymakers going forward? Dual enrollment certainly smooths the process for students. So if we think there are barriers for students to um, filling out forms, to understanding how college works, then dual enrollment means that they're getting those skills while they're still in high school. Um, I think part of the, the positive effect that we see of dual enrollment is that the students who dual enroll while they're in high school tend to be excellent students anyway. Uh, I don't think it's likely a solution for the students who, um, who tend to go to community colleges, for example. Um, after high school. Um, the students who come in with relatively weak academic preparation were probably not able to duly enroll in college while they were in high school. They were trying to get through their high school courses. Well, I'd like to introduce you to what's going on in North Carolina because I think the situation in North Carolina is quite different from that and they're not all going on to senior institutions. Mr. Ethelbaugh, thank you for your story. I'm a former TRIO director. Uh, and uh, loved my experiences there, would have been a TRIO student had there been a program around in those days. I'm interested, though, in how TRIO programs set their standards for success and use evidence-based practices to serve students. Do you use objective benchmarks to measure students' progress over time? And to what extent do you change your program structure to make sure you're using proven strategies to help students earn a college degree? Uh, thank you, Dr. Fox. Yes, we use uh, evidence-based processes. First of all, the Department of Ed requires us to report on our outcomes based on three objective criteria for our student support services program. So um, 
basically a student who persists from one year to the next as well as remains in good standing and graduates within six years. Within that parameters, we've worked with the institution's Office of Institutional Analysis as well as support programs to ensure that we're meeting those benchmarks falling within regulation, and then additionally, what supports that we can really introduce. For example, we've, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, we have a course that we offer that's not offered at an institution at all. It's a developmental math course. We studied the students who took our course, what kinds of grades they got relative to the students who did not take our course. Um, we found that the students who took our course did better in our course, and that seemed obvious, but they also did better going into the next level as well. So we're looking at the process for that, and for those students who did not, we've introduced a new position, a math navigator position, who will work with students who took out at one point our course to help them prepare in the math area. So we've got those connections to the campus to make sure that we're meeting the objectives and working with the institution in such a way to make sure that we're implementing and improving along the way. Thank you. In 1974, I started a developmental math course for our students, which Appalachian State University then used, now uses, still uses for all freshmen coming in that meet the need, that have the need. College courses, all of you are citing six-year graduation rates. <laughs> Dr. Rudd, um, you, that's what you all are talking about. I believe perpetuating this narrative, while convenient for institutions of post-secondary education, is detrimental to prospective students who will take on more debt and spend more time than perhaps necessary to complete their studies. Can you elaborate on how the University of Memphis and your ventures company are not only helping students graduate and find careers, but graduate within four years? Well, I think it's, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think the narrative ought to be, we, we, we need to talk more specifically around four-year graduation rates. Dual enrollment certainly helps do that. It lowers debt and moves students quicker. Our company uh, that we started, and we will continue to expand that. We every, have every expectation uh, that we will expand that exponentially over the course of the next couple of years. It provides the resources necessary for students to focus on a full-time load and, as a result, reduce time to graduation. Uh, that is entirely behind the effort, is to try to reduce debt, reduce time to graduation, provide a pathway to a career, uh, and do that in a, in a truncated time frame. Uh, and we're having good success with that so far. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I was an upward bound counselor when I was in college for, for three years. That was my summer job, and I saw the importance of the TRIO programs. Students in TRIO know that they have a strong support system to assist them in choosing a college and career counseling, tutoring, and more to help them get through. Without TRIO, many of these students wouldn't have graduated. Many wouldn't even have gone to college. So I continue to see the impact of TRIO programs in my district every year. Nearly two-thirds of the students participating in student support services at Thomas Nelson Community College either complete a degree or transfer to a four-year college. Well, there's certainly room for improvement. That's a lot better than the graduate three-year graduation rate of 15%. At Hampton University, 95% of the student support services program participants were either retained or graduated. 94% stayed in good uh, academic standing. At Paul D. Camp Community College, uh, those students had a 100% persistent rate. Uh, the evidence is clear those programs work. And so, Dr. Rudd, uh, the uh, Memphis Advantage program, how does that compare in terms of the services available to a TRIO program? Uh, very similar. Uh, we're just doing that with private money. Uh, so those are just private uh, dollars that uh, that we use to support those students, but very much very similar uh, in terms of, of not just providing financial support, but providing mentorship and development support that addresses some of the psychosocial demands uh, for the students. Our students leave primarily for two reasons. Uh, two reasons, money and psychosocial stressors, and just life circumstance is what tends to drive students away, and uh, that program provides support in that area. Uh, several of you mentioned the number of hours worked is um, detrimental to your progress. Is there a number of hours you could work uh, during the week uh, without affecting academic achievement? 
Um, we have capped the work hours for the students in our ventures program at 20, uh, and so uh, part-time uh, load, and, and we have seen good evidence of that. Uh, and allow students to focus specifically uh, on moving through the system and, and trying to target moving through uh, more quickly than a six year time frame. So uh, I think a cap of 20 hours allows a reasonable amount of time for a student to focus uh, on school as well while meeting financial demands. But again, it raises the issue of making sure they have a wage uh, that is a, a livable wage. Um, uh, several of you in the ranking member mentioned the six year uh, graduation rate, it's obvious that if people are graduating in four years, they will be charging less than Pell Grants, student loans, and everything else. Um, what do you think of programs that would um, provide more Pell Grant assistance if you're graduating on target for four years rather than six? Um, I, I certainly would support that, and uh, the idea of a bonus in terms of movement through I think is a very good idea. We are, along with a lot of universities, are finding tuition incentives for students in terms of tuition reduction if you move through more quickly. Um, so I think there are a lot of different ways of, of providing incentive for students to move uh, through the system quickly and ultimately lower debt. Does anyone else want to comment on programs to take advantage of the fact that those who graduate in four years will cost the federal government less, much less than if they graduate in six years? I could comment on that. Um, and for that matter, those who graduate in two years instead of three years from a community college um, uh, cost a lot less. So the, the, um, the ASAP program that, that CUNY um, uh, uh, came up with and that's been extended to Ohio uh, costs less to um, produce a degree than uh, other community colleges do because the students are getting through so quickly. So while you're having to spend a few thousand more per student per year, you're actually spending less per degree. And uh, can you talk about the eligibility for financial aid to cover remedial courses? That is a problem for a lot of disadvantaged students is that they come in um, uh, uh, having to take um, courses and using their grants um, for courses that don't move them towards a degree. So you know, you, if you don't even get to credit bearing courses, you're not making progress towards your degree, but you are using up your Pell Grant dollars. Well, what's the alternative? Extending Pell Grant to eligibility for students who need more support. Thank you. You're back. Thank, thank you. Mr. Klein? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Professor Dynarski, I believe I heard you say that in your studies, uh, it was clear that the largest, the biggest challenge to uh, completion rates is uh, not necessarily the uh, external factors, but the cost of uh, completion. Is that essentially just the increased costs of, of uh, higher education? Is that proving to be the the highest barrier to uh, completion rates? I would say that um, uh, access to quality institutions is, is probably the greatest barrier. Okay. Um, so um, uh, even if we uh, make education free, at, as we, education's free in, in K-12, um, for post-secondary, um, we charge Nothing's something. Nothing's free when, uh, when it's of provided course, by the government. I'm an economist. Like some, so everyone's pay, somebody's paying, of course. Right. Um, but my point is that it's free to the student. Right. Um, if we make colleges free, but we don't provide quality educations, we're not doing anybody a favor. OK. So uh, the increased costs are definitely uh, providing uh, some barriers to students to uh, either uh, achieving a four-year degree, starting down the road to college or, or completion. Um, Dr. Rudd, I, I followed with interest the, your testimony about the, the Ventures program, the ACE program, the, the finish line, helping meet the costs of achieving that higher education. Um, but affordability is, is a concern for me. Um, want to actually drill down a bit. Have, have your costs um, I know your costs have increased in providing that education. Um, has your tuition rate, how much has it gone up over the past five years? 
Uh, this is actually the, the last five-year stretch of the lowest tuition increases in our history. So we actually have an average of 1.7% of uh, per year over the last five years. Uh, we've had two years with no tuition increase over the course of the last five years. That's fantastic. Have, so obviously your costs have risen. What have you done internally to address uh, and control those costs? Uh, well, we, we've got a, a broad, we do two things. We've got a, a broad base overall efficiency and effectiveness uh, effort that we do in terms of looking at the efficiency of what we do administratively, how we deliver what we do. But more importantly, and I think one of the things that's lost in some of the discussion is, as retention and completion improves, our overall funding level has improved. We just haven't, we, we have offset student cost with our improved performance. And uh, as our retention goes up, we have more tuition dollars. And as our performance goes up, our funding in the state is a performance-based funding. So our state level support has gone up and we have not moved that to the students. We have, we have contained it. Uh, recognizing that affordability and financial pressure is the number one stressor for students moving through and completing. So in terms of your um, administration costs, your um different costs uh, of um, whether it's course offerings, how many are scaling back the course offerings, um, energy costs, what, what is your greatest stressor on, on uh, in terms of cost of providing that education? Uh, personnel cost. Uh, probably 80% of, of what we do from a budget perspective are personnel costs. Uh, and certainly, uh, and certainly, insurance is always an escalating cost for us. Mm. Okay. Um, any innovations there? Any uh, in terms of health insurance or retirement funds or um, any kind of? Are you increasing the percentage of part-time faculty that you? Hire we or? we have actually we have actually moved to try to uh, to try to cap. The, the percentage of part-time faculty. We, we've been concerned about making sure that we continue to deliver a quality uh, educational experience and, and to make sure that uh, adjunct and, and part-time faculty that we limit the number of individuals. Uh, we certainly hire more, uh, we certainly hire more more full-time teaching faculty than we have in the past. I mean, we've looked at overall workload and teaching load as a part of that as well. What about your administrative costs as a percent of your budget? Have you scaled back your administrative um, personnel? Uh, we have. We, we arguably have less administration uh, uh, today than we had a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago. I certainly tell you my office is less than half the size it was six years ago. Uh, so we have been very thoughtful. We also have moved to try and we're actively working on trying to, to calculate a good administrative index to think about how we share and discuss, particularly with our trustees and the community, about administrative uh, cost. Uh, and, and we're actively exploring how best to create a metric around doing that, one that uh, really captures it well. But we've, met, we've had a strong commitment to reducing administrative, uh, administrative costs. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Rudd. Mr. Sablon. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, um, I'm going to have questions for the records that I will submit, and if you would please respond to those in writing. Uh, I'm going to go off the guard rail here. I usually do that. And if I don't make sense, please tell me. But, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter that four out of 10 students who enroll in four-year colleges never graduate, it's, it's, that's a serious, that's a, an unfortunate. We hope to be able to improve that, I think. Uh, and more so that, you know, um, students of color, uh, uh, the graduation rate for students of color uh, compared to uh, white students, um, I don't like using those terms, but that's what they are called. Uh, for blacks, African, for black students, it's uh, even worse, 64% for versus 40%, for example, and for Latinos, it's 64% versus 54%. 
uh, and, and also gaps in graduation rates are also large across family income. Uh, in his opening statement, the ranking member uh, mentioned that uh, maybe the idea that we should hold some of the schools accountable for student failures to graduate, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm gonna come back to Mr. Et eventually in a question for record with Mr. Ethelba, because I need to go back and check about the TRIO program in our community college. But is there a, something we could do to truly like, I know schools, for profit schools are not exactly popular with some of the things that they do. But is there something you think in policy we could do to hold the schools accountable for when their students don't graduate? Um, that maybe some programs that are intention, in, intended to help the students uh, through their four or six years even uh, progress uh, are not effectively managed or not made available. Is there something you think in terms of policy that can be done to hold some of the schools accountable for, not all, just some students just fail because they won't study, you know. Uh, my goodness, he's gonna kill me. My son took eight years to get his teacher's degree also. Um, but is there something we could do, you think? Anybody in the panel? Any suggestion, idea? Hold the schools also accountable. Look at, at the reluctance of my colleagues. I'm I know, I'm into this one. Really. Um, I, I think in the past, um, particularly for um, short term educational programs, we ha have had, or vocational programs, uh, we have um, tried things like gainful employment reporting to make sure that you have a number of graduates over a number I like, of I like years. That. I'm a metric and, too. and those things are fine. I think colleges are, on the whole, happy to be held accountable. But what I saw on the other side of the balance is that if you don't resource the colleges the way that they need to be resourced so the job can't get done, then what exactly are we measuring? Do we also measure then on the other end, um, on, the, on the balance of gainful employment, um, adequate resources for doing the coaching, <coughs> doing the advising, during the academic um, remediation that we need to do? So, so I think it's a larger question than, okay, you know, you're gonna share this risk with us, you're gonna share this accountability with us, but not if, in some ways, my state funding has been going down for the last 10 years. So I, I think there is a, there's a real larger conversation than just a number to be accounted for. Okay, and now I'm gonna go to another question, if I may, and each panel can answer yes or no. Do you support, uh, free tuition for students. Dr. Dynoski, I think you. So it, our past is that tuition was free at community colleges in particular. So historically, community colleges have been free uh, or near free in most places. Four-year college. Four-year colleges yeah. also in some places have been free. There are many different ways to fund to fund college. Um, uh, I do feel firmly that, that um, job training, that um, programs, um, uh, that are intended to prepare people for careers are ones that people shouldn't be borrowing for. Okay, uh, it's okay. too risky, yeah, and we I should see. not run our training programs through those. She's going to cut me off. Uh, Ms. Dr. Rod, do you support free college tuition for students? Well, I, I think it's been successful. If you look in Tennessee, certainly the uh, Tennessee Promise has been successful, increasing the number of students that like not it just... Is in other country, in Norway, for example. Um, I, I think there's good evidence that uh, that it can be effective, uh, but gonna, it, there are so many gonna, other costs. Your school's going to be paid, but somebody will pay for it. Thank you, Dr. Rudd. Right. I'm going to have to turn yeah. to our, our next uh, Thank questioner. You. Dr. Roth, um, Mr. Rothman. Thank you. Uh, first question for you. At least in my district, I find not just people who dropped out of college, but people who complete college frequently go back to technical school, go back to trade school, which would indicate we have too many people going to college. Uh, what percentage of, say, high school graduates do you think ought to go to college? Do you think that's too high today, or what, 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 would, what, would, your be, what would your ideal percentage be? Anyone want to take a crack? We're, we're at 30% of, of people are getting a BA. Um, uh, and for low-income uh, students, it's more like 10%. So 
I, we tend to live in places where um, lots of educated people aggregate, and so it seems like everybody has a college degree, but 30% um, and 10% certainly do not sound to me like too much um, college education. We've fallen behind a dozen countries in the world in our degree attainment. Uh, we used to lead the world. Uh, well, well, as the other people here, is it concern you when people with college degrees are dissatisfied with their employment and go back to a tech school or go back to a, a trade school uh, where they can get, be trained for, a, first of all, have a, a greater likelihood of being employed and secondly are, are able to make more money. Does that concern you? And does it indicate that maybe we have too many people going to some colleges? None of you believe that, huh? I think it's a really terrific thing for someone to have gotten a terrific education and being able to self-reflect and understand that they need additional education in something specific and career-oriented. So that um, doesn't bother you if somebody no, graduates from college? No, not at all. I really, be I really believe that at this day and age where the skills in the work in the workplace is outpacing um, our programs at the colleges, that um, folks have to learn how to learn. And one piece of learning how to learn is to self-reflect. If someone believes that over the next five years they're better off as a plumber and they have a bachelor's degree, Maybe at the end of that five years, they'd be opening a business that's a plumbing business, and therefore they will have the skills okay. to do it. I, I, I think we do you. way it, too much I, of that. Yeah, I, I would think that's part of our problem. Yeah. Uh, next question I have. Um, I know many, not all, institutions require SAT, ACT tests. Is there a correlation between how well you do on an SAT or ACT test and whether you, get, whether you uh, are able to, go to graduate in five or six years? Does anybody have an answer to that question? Um, our internal data actually suggests that your grade point average is a better indicator uh, than uh, than the SAT or the well, ACT. Uh, yeah, but the question yeah, that, was, we don't we don't have a great. You mean your grade point in high school? Your grade yeah, your GPA in high school is a better is a better indicator of whether or not you're going to finish in four, five, or six years. Okay, um, is the SAT or ACT is that relevant? Is that a, is there a correlation there? Uh, there's certainly, I mean, we there are, are levels of scores on the ACT or the SAT. Yeah, I know, but is there a correlation or not? I mean, um, there is there is a correlation between the SAT and success in college, and something that the SAT and the ACT provide us is a consistent measure across high schools that may have very different uh, GPA standards. They they tend to serve as a check on what the GPA is. Okay, and do you think we could learn something from that as far as admitting people with lower ACTs, SATs? Maybe not. Maybe we can't learn anything from that. Um, okay, next question. We'll go, we'll go back to the dual enrollment. Um, I know that's becoming more common. Is there, we'll ask somebody on the, Dr. Ettinger or Mr. Ethelbaugh. Um, is there a correlation between uh, taking more dual enrollment classes and finishing in five or, five or six years, whatever the metric is? There is. We have a high level of, a way higher level of college participation in the 80s for the students who are either in dual enrollment or in early college. Um, but the real advantage is that by the time they get out of early college and dual enrollment, they're at college level. So they're not doing developmental work in college, and therefore it speeds up the process. Do you think, do you think more dual enrollment should be encouraged then? Yes. It is something that is encouraged with our TRIO programs as well. Uh, the, the students that I have seen who have participated in dual enrollment through TRIO programs um, uh, come into the institution at higher levels and therefore decrease their time to graduate. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you so much, the chair and ranking member, and, and to all of our, our witnesses. Um, first, I want to say I'm, I'm, I'm sorry Representative Stefanik left because she asked you about reforming the federal work study program, and I invite her and anyone here uh, to sign on to the Opportunities for Success Bill, which is a piece of legislation I introduced to do just that, including uh, modernizing the, uh, the funding, but also aligning work-study jobs with students' career interests and goals. 
Um, so we, we know that as a, a nation, we need to do more uh, to make sure that all students can access and complete a college education. And we've had a lot of conversations here about TRIO and, of course, Gear Up and the, the programs that are especially helping to address barriers to completion and um, historically underserved students, first-generation students. Thank you, Mr. Ethelbaugh, for your, your story and your work. Um, I want to point out uh, a successful program uh, in Northwest Oregon, Future Connects. It's a comprehensive support program that provides low-income first-generation students at Portland Community College with, a personalized, with, with personalized academic advising, a college success coach, which is really the mentoring piece that's so important, access to internships, an intensive summer <laughs> orientation program, and need-based scholarships. And it's, it's really been a successful model there uh, because obviously, uh, even though TRIO, Gear Up and TRIO are great programs, there's still a lot of unmet need. Um, so that, that's something that we can look at as we're seeking to address these barriers. And I'm going to follow up on the question that Mr. Takano and Ms. Jayapal asked. Uh, I, I just read this report, Wisconsin Hope Center, highlighting the issue of food and housing insecurity. Uh, seven out of ten students at two-year colleges and six out of ten students at four-year colleges experience some food or housing insecurity over the course of a single year. Those are pretty staggering numbers. Um, they found that only 20% of food insecure students receive SNAP benefits, only 7% of students who experience homelessness received any housing assistance. Um, and, and when we're talking about you know, completion, it's really challenging to try to complete if you're hungry and you don't have a safe place to live. Uh, I know this is an issue in Oregon. I just had a roundtable conversation about it um, in many of the institutions. Oregon State University, Portland Community College, Portland State University, which is an urban institute, have uh, food pantries on, on campus. Mr. Ethelbau, you work directly, I know, with low-income first-generation students every day. What, what role does housing and food insecurity, what, what role does that play in students' lives? Oh, it plays a huge role. I mean, you just have to look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If your basic needs aren't met, including home, shelter, food, you can't progress upwards and think about anything else beyond how are you going to get your next meal or where you're going to live the, um, for the night. Can uh, everybody the, just tell me? I'm on, I want you to finish, but can everybody then just tell me? Because um, I want to get another question. What is your campus doing to address these issues, Mr. And I was just going to mention that at the University of Utah, we have created a homeless student task force, and it's a group of individuals from varying parts of the campus that work together to ensure that we are collectively moving forward with efforts to address some of these concerns. One of the things ha has come up as a challenge within this group, however, is we're using federal data to determine eligibility for certain types of assistance. For example, if we're going to put someone up in our local hotel for a night or two, we do have to report that as an additional form of financial assistance. So if you have a low-income student that has already met the threshold for their cost of attendance, they basically are going to go into an over-award situation, Understood. which is going to penalize them for getting an additional assistant for what they actually need versus really trying to help. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Dr. Enger, what, what, what is your campus doing about food insecurity and homelessness? We've established a single stop office, which is an emergency office where all students can come, so they know when to come. Um, food pantries, mobile food pantries, food cards, a whole range of emergency services. It's probably about, I would say, half a million dollars worth of investment every year. Um, and we're working on the possibility of pushing policy to align policy of SNAP, Pell, and all of the major Excellent. pieces that really need to fit together. Dr. Dr. Redd, I'm going to run out of time. Dr. Redd. Dr. Yeah, we, we have a food pantry as well. We also have raised some private support for uh, to support homeless students. Uh, we have a limited number uh, of homeless individuals. And then we've worked with our new dining provider to have them carve off a program and create a program to address food right. insecurity as a part of the dining contract that we have. Dr. Dynowski. Uh, I just wanted to say that are, we generally have a shredded safety net, and that applies to students as well. And what we're left with is colleges having to play the role that social policy programs should play. Thank you. And I, I am out of time. I'm going to submit for the record. I really want to follow up on the gaps uh, in degree attainment by race and income and, and really looking at targeting interventions that students are least likely to compete, complete. So I'll, I'll submit that for the record. Thank you. Back. Thank you. Mr. Muser. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
As we've heard this morning, four-year completion rates are really no longer the norm. So I wanted to ask a couple of questions related to student advisors uh, and the routine that they meet with, with students. Uh, is it twice a semester? Uh, is it once a quarter? And do the conversations include all of the criteria we're speaking about? The, the, the student's major, are they on track for it? The amount of loan that they have out, the amount of debt or cost that they're, they're building, um, whether they're gonna complete their major and be able to graduate on time. Are these conversations recorded? Are they agreed to? So is there some sort of record of it? Uh, and do you consider allowing some sort of waiver so as parents or the payer, the one, the, the one investing in the, in the student, is also made aware of, of these, these uh, conversations and this guidance provided. Dr. Edinger? I wish it were that straightforward. Um, with an average age of 26 on campus, every single student I have has a different situation, and many of them are adults. They have no parents, or their parents are not in their lives. Um, the conversations would start with the transition when they first come in. They would get financial aid um, advising. They would get academic advising. Um, we would send out tweets. We would send out texts to these students to alert them of deadlines and so on and so forth. And they have peer mentors in their learning communities. There's a whole web of, of advising that goes on. Um, it, is, it is not as straightforward as taking a high school senior and taking them through into the first year of residential. It is complex. Well, I think there are a lot of examples where it could be a lot better. Uh, so this is something that we, we could talk about in the future. I yield back the rest of my time to Dr. Fox. The gentleman thank yields, you. Dr. Park. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Muser, and thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I want to um, follow up a little bit on some uh, comments that were made in um, your opening statements. And I'd like to go to um, Dr. Edinger. You say in your opening statement that we're the source for the future workshop in what we call new collar jobs, jobs that are middle skills that pay well. Tell me what you think middle skills are and what do baccalaureate institutions, what would you call higher skills that a student would get in a baccalaureate institution that they wouldn't need for a new job? Here is an example. In the, uh, in the field of information technology or IT, um, there is a series of um, uh, entry-level programming jobs that someone with um, a year or two years worth of training um, and education. About education. Yes. Not training. Yeah. Well, skills training and then education on the liberal arts and, and, and critical skills and so on. That combination. Once, um, once they are able to get that, um, get that particular credential, they can enter that workforce. Now, if they want to advance to be a systems administrator and so on, they will need a bachelor's degree. But it is a beginning and it pays well. Um, and those jobs didn't exist, let's say, five, ten years ago. Okay. Well, sometime I'd like to pursue with you, maybe privately, what you think that they're getting in that baccalaureate degree that provides them what they need other than the degree itself. Because I'm questioning whether or not, what middle skills are, because I think what you need for coding and those IT jobs are the skills you're gonna need for everything else that you're getting. Um, I also wanna ask each of you to, um, to answer a question for me, uh, and I'll come back to in my comments later. Um, Dr. Dynarski, you said that for-profit schools should innovate, they should be held accountable, and there should be oversight in a robust manner. Do you not believe all post-secondary institutions should be doing that? Just answer me yes or no, each one of you. Start with Dr. Dynorski. Should they innovate, should they be held accountable, and should they have oversight? Yes. Yes. 
Yes. I don't understand then why for-profits are being singled out in this area. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Adams. Thank you very much, um, Chairwoman Davis and Ranking Member Smucker. Thank you to the um, individuals who are here to testify today. Uh, it, it's clear from the testimony that many of the biggest challenges faced by today's college students are related to poverty, housing, food insecurity, long hours, and, and sudden financial emergencies. But I wonder if institutions sometimes establish policies and, and practices that can create unintended barriers that, that make it really confusing for students particularly first-generation students. Um, uh, Mr. Ethelbach, can you tell us a little bit about the logistical and bureaucratic barriers that, that are faced by low-income first-generation students? Uh, definitely. Uh, an example that I tend to see quite a bit, especially as we enter into the summer area, is the, uh, the, the hold your spot fee that's required by institutions. That uh, individual has to pay a fee in order to indicate they're going to be enrolling in the fall. What I've started to see with a lot of our students is an increased number of our applications for financial aid have been stopped for verification. And so oftentimes the verification takes about six to eight weeks. By the time they're flagged to, to have to pay this enrollment deposit, and then the time it takes to actually verify to that so that they can get that waiver, um, get that fee waived, the time that takes in between that they're losing valuable time in order to meet with an advisor, to get their classes structured, to really be able to become a student before the actual semester starts. And it's a big, uh, a big, barrier in terms of getting our low-income students into the door. Thank you. I, I spent 40 years on the campus of Bennett College in Greensboro and uh, know very well the, the many obstacles that students face. So Dr. Rudd, Dr. Ettinger, what steps have you taken at your campuses to make higher education easier to navigate? Well, I think we've, uh, for students who, certainly first generation students and students who haven't been on a college campus, we've created a, a broad array of support programs that help educate them about the navigation of a campus and about what it, how you get around a campus and how you deal with the realities of campus from the bursar to all the way uh, to my office. And I think for students outside of the first generations, we've simplified our, we've tried to simplify the process as much as we can and make things accessible to students. And that means, if that means digital access, we, we try to do that as well. So I think simplifying it, making it accessible is critical, but for first generation students, they're gonna require some direct face-to-face -face mentorship as a part of that, and we've created a broad array of programs around that. Dr. Edinger? Um, I think the first is a sense of place, knowing where to go and, and, and ha not having to sort of wander around the campus looking for emergency services or financial services. Um, so single stop and student central are the two spots that we found for students to gather. The other is a sense of process. Um, we used to have something called the Bunker Hill Bounce where we bounce students all over the place for just one question. We don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, and the third is really for our faculty and staff and the administration to understand that we're dealing with an adult whole student, um, not, not some concept of a, of, a, of a 18 year old, but the whole range of um, needs of a student who is who we haven't seen before. We've got to be ready for them rather than saying you got to be ready for us. Okay. And I think that mindset. Great. Thank you. So let me, uh, Dr. Rudd, uh, can you talk about uh, how you've seen uh, micro grants or emergency grants uh, and, and what they, have, if, if you've been doing that to help students get across that finish line uh, if, and if the strategy makes sense? Uh, we created a, an emergency grant program, and, and uh, part of the reason we did that is we, we saw a significant number of students who would stop out uh, based on very small amounts of money, two, three hundred dollars from free, uh, spring to, to summer or, or fall to spring. Um, so we did create a, a micro grant program that has been heavily utilized. And, and it naturally, as you might imagine, has had disproportionate impact on the retention rates and completion rates of the most vulnerable students that we have. Great, thank you very much. Dr. Edinger, did you wanna? Yeah, the, the same, okay. absolutely the same. Very good, thank you, thank you all very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had the privilege to meet several TRIO students from my home state of Kansas recently, and they were all first time uh, college uh, students, and it was real inspiring. Uh, these uh, includes University of Kansas, Kansas State University, um, Haskell Indian Nations University, and several others. 
and, uh, and they really blew me away as to how much they care and they value their education. Um, since the inception of the Higher Ed Education Act of 1965, Congress has focused on increasing the success of disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged students, thank goodness. Uh, this hearing today is certainly timely as we consider reauthorizing the HEA. We look to reviewing strategies that work. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ethelbaugh, as the director of University of uh, Utah's TRIO program, um, how frequently do you review uh, the best practices or the standards? What kind of standard metrics do you use to, to gauge progress? Um, we, we've been on an effort to really join with our Office of Institutional Analysis at the University of Utah to really track our efforts as they relate to other students who are not participating in our programs. So the same types of services, advising, financial aid, as well as completion rates. rates. We've really started to look at that data a lot more closely to understand what it is that we're doing right that we can replicate and what we can improve upon. And so a couple of things that have come with that is the need to really reassess how we're providing our tutoring program, for example. We were providing the traditional types of tutoring components that we've always done, but our students are working more. They're not on campus as much. So we've had to be innovative this past year and we introduced an online tutoring platform. We've assessed that to see how it's impacted the grades that the students are getting in the courses that they were taking the, the tutoring for, and it's had a very positive impact. And the students themselves have said that the introduction of this has allowed them to, to just do tutoring as soon as they get home out from work at 10.30 at night so that they don't have to come back to campus to be able to be successful. So this is a small example of some of the things that we're really trying to do to improve our services. Great, thank you, Mr. Ethelbaugh. Thank you to the panel. And I yield my time, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman Davis and Ranking Member Smucker and the witnesses for being here today. Uh, Dr. Donarski, at the end of the questioning, uh, Ranking Member F Fox posed a question rhetorically uh, as to why members on our side of the aisle uh, continue to single out for-profit schools as a sector in higher ed in need of increased accountability and oversight. Could you shed some light on why that sector has received increased focus of concern? Yes, so the for-profit sector has the um, lowest graduation rates, um, as we indicated. Um, uh, more concerningly, however, uh, students who go to these colleges get no financial benefit from it at all. Um, so uh, Stephanie Cellini and um, Nicholas Turner showed using the universe of data on earnings for for-profit students uh, that they made no more coming out of college than they made coming in. This is in distinct contrast to the evidence from four-year colleges and from community colleges where we consistently find that there is financial benefit, that there are earnings returns to take even just a few credits of college. So it's a sector in which people are not getting any returns for their educations, and they are getting much higher debt loads than they are at the public institutions. Um, and what the result has been is that uh, for students coming out of these schools with low earnings and high debt, we see enormous defaults in financial distress. As a sector, it's performing far worse than the other sectors. Well, as one of the many capitalists in the Democratic Party, uh, that seems like a failure uh, for the customers. Not good. Great. Something I'm also passionate about, and I know many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are, is criminal justice reform. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter the record the report from the Vera Institute of Justice, investing in futures, economic and physical benefits of post-secondary education in prison. Thank you. 64% of incarcerated people are academically eligible to enroll in college prison programs, but the data shows only 9% ever complete any kind of a program. Incarcerated individuals have been excluded from Pell since 1994. Uh, Dr. Donarski, what are your thoughts on lifting the Pell ban completely for incarcerated students, and what impact would that have on individuals in society by spending the money up front, helping them with Pell, giving them two, three, four years to train, to succeed,
because when they leave prison, we're getting a 75% recidivism rate. So we're just pouring the money in a circular fashion back in the prisons, and we're not helping people get a second chance that they can actually succeed with. So what do we need to do here? If we would like um, um, prisoners to, uh, to reenter society as productive, productive members um, uh, of the workforce, they need a, a good education to do so. Uh, and it seems like um, prison is a, is a good opportunity in which to, to um, increase educations. That's where a lot of people get their GEDs and being able to follow on for college education um, um, would certainly be helpful for their lives after they exit prison. How do we ensure these programs are high quality and best support them? Because they may not want to study British literature, but I'm guessing they would love to learn how to be a, a mechanic drywall, plumber, great jobs uh, that we need folks in the workforce now. How do we make that happen? What are the steps? In the past, um, prisons have partnered with local community colleges and, and universities. So rather than start their own programs, um, they essentially would work with the local um, institutions, um, which were of good quality, and, and uh, tap on their resources. Exactly, we're doing some of that in our district. What state have you seen does the best job of connecting community college with real programs to create jobs for folks so they can succeed and have a real second chance? Pretty much we see across the country that community college students succeed. Um, um, they um, uh, come out with skills uh, that are valuable to the workforce uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna pick on any one particular state as being a failure or a success, the community college sector has done quite well. Thank you, I yield back my time. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you all for being here. I just, uh, I wanna talk about resources and um, do some comparisons. I'd like to compare some statistics between community colleges and for-profit schools in my district in ne Las Vegas, Nevada, and Henderson. At uh, the College of Southern Nevada, tuition's about $3,000 per year, and the institution spends approximately $2.30 on instruction for each dollar it collects in tuition. At a sample for-profit school in my district, the average annual tuition is $9,000, and anywhere between 20 and 50 cents per dollar collected is spent on tuition. And the schools that attempt to do the most for our students, especially students historically underserved by four-year colleges and at the lowest cost to taxpayers are often our community college. Yet we know that community college gets the least amount of federal support or support from federal aid programs. I'd like to also look at the prevalence of default among those attending for-profit rather than community colleges. According to Brookings, 73% of students who attend for-profits had to borrow to attend, and they had an average of about $5,400 in federal loans. Compare that to 19% of students who attend community colleges averaging approximately $900 in, federally, in federal loans. And then according to the Department of Education, students who attend for-profits are more likely to default on their loans at 16% than those attending community colleges and public four-year institutions at 10% or private nonprofits at seven. It's clear we have a system in which um, federal dollars are not being channeled to institutions like community college that, colleges that are well situated to help those students that are vying for greater ac academic and social mobility. And given the outcomes that we've seen with for-profit institutions in terms of costs, completion, student debt levels, and closures, I wonder how federal dollars that are currently being flowing to these schools, whether indirectly, could be spent on our under-resourced schools like community colleges, so that they have the funding to support the success of our most at-risk students. Uh, Dr. Dr. Dynarski, do you think that students who attend for-profit schools would be better served if they had the option of attending affordable but well-funded public institutions such as community colleges, and what do you believe is the best use of federal dollars? 
The evidence we have um, from California in particular is that when community colleges are not well-funded, that's when students turn to the for-profit colleges. So there is a direct link here. The t same types of students attend for-profits, and, and it's, it's, the same, um, it's the same set of students moving back and forth. And it's a set of students for whom college is a risky bet. Right? So we know that on average, college pays off. But for disadvantaged students, students that come in with weak preparation, it's particularly risky. In the for-profit colleges, the risk lies squarely on the student because they take out loans and they pay tuition uh, uh, to cover the cost of their education. And if the education doesn't work out, they're the ones stuck with all of the downside. Community colleges, the schools, the public essentially are taking on the risk of that bet for those, for those students. And it is a safer place for them to be. Uh, the uh, amount of money that's spent on instruction per uh, dollar of revenue is also, as you pointed out, much higher at the community colleges. Uh, in the for-profits, a lot of that money is going into advertising and into profits. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn a little bit, I'm going to turn towards accountability. During our last hearing, uh, we, we addressed these issues and we heard that states most states subject for-profit institutions to lower levels of oversight than public institutions. And I think this is especially important when we look at outcomes specifically. You mentioned that 35% of those who enter uh, for-profit four-year colleges will earn a degree in six years compared to 65% at four-year uh, public four-year colleges and 76% respectively at nonprofit four-year colleges. Uh, given, this given that information in your research, what do you think is the right approach on for-profit institutions, and does this include better accreditation standards? So accreditation is common across all of these institutions. The public institutions have the added oversight of the governments that are running them. Right? The, the, the for-profits don't, don't have that, um, uh, and I think that is the reason that this sector in particular needs greater oversight. Thank you Thank very you. much. I yield. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Ready? No, okay. No. According to the rule and questioning of witnesses, uh, my colleague uh, shares will take into consideration the ratio of the majority to minority party members present, and shall establish the order of recognition. So, I think according to the rules, it's. Yeah, see, the difficulty is that she's, she's not on the subcommittee, so we need to have you go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, um, I appreciated the uh, questioning about uh, using Pell Grants for prisoners, and uh, at some point, um, Doc, Dr. Dynarski, um, I'd like us to follow up on this. North Carolina already does programs in prisons for students. Again, when I was at the community college, we had programs at the prisons, and I've recently talked to North Carolina people who run these programs, and they are meeting the total need right now with state money. So I do not understand why we want to burden people all over this country to pay for programs for prisons by giving them Pell Grants when the states themselves can take care of this. And as you mentioned, there are good programs all over the country. And uh, Madam Chairman, at some point between now and the uh, time, that our deadline, I would like to get some uh, information into the record on what is happening uh, with, Pell, with programs in the various states for prisoners. So I'm, I'm not really sure where this push for Pell is coming from. Um, I would like to um, go back to something um, Dr. Rudd said about uh, flexibility for work study. Um, I'd like you to expand just a little bit on this. I will tell you, under current conditions, you're exactly right. Only 25% of work study can be used off campus. 75% must be used on campus. I think this is w a, a ridiculous rule. Under the PROSPER Act that we had last year and passed out of committee, we um, allowed up, we allowed all of the money to be used off campus because we believe that there should be more 
uh, financial aid available for students to go into apprenticeships, internships that lead to real jobs, not working in the college library. So you want to make another comment. How much of that work-study money could you use for work for students to get real jobs? My guess is we could use the vast majority of it, if not all of it, uh, to help them do that. I mean, we certainly have significant demand in Memphis, and, and we've got good partners uh, that I think would be more than uh, eager to do that and create nice, nice pathways for those students. Right. Uh, Madam Chairman, I'd like to um, put in the record uh, statistics from the College Board related to uh, the comparison of HBCUs uh, for-profit schools and public associate degree granting colleges. Um, the number of HBCUs in our country are 98. Um, the number with a graduation rate over 58 percent, four. Uh, the number of HBCUs whose graduates have higher than average starting salary, two. The number of for-profit schools, 817. The graduation rate over 58%. The national average is 260. And by the way, that includes Platt College in Representative Davis's district, Brightwood College in Representative Ticano's district, Herzing University in Representative Omar's district. About 32% of for-profit schools on college scoreboard outperform the national graduate rate average. Number of for-profits whose graduates have a higher than average starting salary, 29, which is a higher percentage than both two-year and HBCUs. The number of two-year community colleges, 1,268. Graduation rate over 58%, the national average, 52. Will the gentlelady uh, yield for a question? Uh, as soon as I complete. About 4% of public associate degree granting institutions on college scoreboard performed above the national average. The number of community colleges whose graduates have a higher than average starting salary, 55. That's 55 out of 1,268. And I thank you. There is nobody who's a more who's a greater advocate of community colleges than I am, and I believe that community colleges can do better. But we need to be treating all sectors equally, all of them. We should have accountability for all sectors of education because the taxpayers are paying one way or another for what passes as education in these institutions. Yes, ma'am, I'll Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Rocks, I'm just wondering if, if you were aware of um, Brightbird College, I think there may be, have been others in there that actually have closed. And I think the difficulty that we all have is that there's really no option for the students when, for any number of reasons, um, the, the colleges close, and they usually close on a dime uh, with no notice to students and no ability for them to recoup the, their losses. So I think that's part of what we're dealing with. I think the other issue, of course, has to do with our veterans. And there are programs that our veterans attend uh, that work out well for them. But there are others that really create tremendous difficulty because they, it's, it's not unlike um, what, what I think our witnesses have stated, that in fact people have no higher earnings than they did when they started. And in terms of our military, they have no more skills uh, than they started. And that is not a situation that I think we're, we're interested in. But it's an ongoing conversation, and um, we certainly hope to engage in that, and I think you've all presented um, some good information. I want to turn now uh, to Ms. Wild, who is uh, on the Education Committee, of course, but not on the subcommittee. So she goes last. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm very happy uh, that we're having this hearing today. And I came over, um, even though I'm not on the subcommittee, because of my extreme interest in this subject. Um, I'd, I'd like to, before I turn to my questions, respond to the comment made earlier that we must treat all institutions the same, regardless of tax status. Um, Ranking Member Fox, 
um, has repeated, repeatedly suggested that it's somehow unfair or unwise to apply accountability standards solely to for-profit institutions. But this argument completely ignores the reality that the sectors already operate under very different oversight and accountability structures. States have direct governance authority over public institutions, and private nonprofit institutions are operated by trustees who are legally committed to the public interest. Only in the for-profit sector can college leaders benefit personally from the operations of their institutions. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. Due in part to these differences in structure and incentives, for-profit colleges have consistently worse outcomes. For example, only about a quarter, 25% of students enrolled at for-profit colleges complete a bachelor's degree within six years, compared to 59% at public institutions and 66% at nonprofits. Among students enrolled in two-year programs, those attending for-profits are nearly four times as likely to default on their loans compared to their counterparts at community colleges. And it, so it's clear to me that we have to increase oversight of the for-profit sector and design accountability systems that reflect the inherent differences of the sector. And I would urge my colleagues to work with me in this effort to protect students and taxpayers. This has um, happened, in fact, in my own district at what was known as Lehigh Valley College, um, and the, all of the problems I've just described applied to that school before it, it closed, and in fact, it ended up being investigated by our state attorney general. Um, moving on, while the cost of education um, of college has sharply increased in recent decades, so have the financial benefits of a college degree. And in this space, I think it's so important for us to be talking about the fact that the cost of non-completion while still incurring student loan debt, is devastating. Um, you know, I have excellent six-year, uh, six excellent four-year college and um, universities in my district, really, really highly regarded, nationally known schools. But since coming to Congress, I have come to learn of um, more about the, and specifically because of my work on this committee, I've become very intimately acquainted with the two community colleges in my district, Lehigh Carbon Community College in uh, west of Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Northampton uh, Community College on the eastern side of my district. Um, and they are, they offer, together, they offer the students of my district a range of really high quality academic and career training programs ranging from things like history and liberal arts and, and engineering to nursing and hotel management to aviation and CDL licensing. Um, and 93 to 94% of the graduates from those two community colleges are either continuing their education or in a career. Um, so I have just become a huge fan of the community college space. But at the same time, it seems to me that students at these two-year colleges are also more likely, um, more likely to need additional resources because of the challenges that they face in addition to preparing for colleges and paying for tuition. Um, they face gaps in their financial aid, as I've learned. They struggle to pay for extra needs that come up. They str often struggle to pay for three meals a day. I learned that every college in my district maintains a food bank and that they are particularly highly utilized at the two community colleges. They have trouble with transportation costs and, and the, the huge expense of childcare. Um, both, both of the community colleges have very wonderful on-site childcare centers. So with all of that as a preface, um, I'd like to turn to you, Mr. Ethelbaugh, because I found your written testimony to be especially compelling. And I'd like to, to know from you or any of the other witnesses, what can we as the federal government do to support these institutions in their efforts to help keep students on a path to graduation? And I'm sorry, I've almost used up all my time, but if you could. Um, 
you know, obviously finances is going to be the, the number one thing that is, is referenced, and it's often what we hear the most of. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we have seen in terms of the impact is students will tend in our institution to stay enrolled for the first two years and then drop off because of family obligations. So looking at opportunities in the third and fourth years to really supplement the uh, financial aid that they can receive in that, and then also really incorporating much more broader um, items that you can include within the financial aid to include housing assistance as well as food benefits, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we've come to the, uh, the conclusion of the, the questions, but um, we have a, f a few, more, few more things to do here. So I wanted to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing, preferably in Microsoft Word format. The material submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing, and only a member of the committee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each, 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required <clears throat> excuse me, time frame, but please recognize that years from now, that link may no longer work. I want to thank you all uh, for being here, uh, participating, and certainly giving us a lot of good information and areas that we can explore further. What we heard is certainly very valuable. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for you, and we ask the witnesses to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. And I want to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days, and the questions submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. And it's now my pleasure to recognize the distinguished ranking member for his closing statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to thank the witnesses uh, for being here as well, and would now like to yield my time for a closing statement to the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Dr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Schmucker. One of the things I'm proud of is that we as a committee have really begun to talk about skills education in conjunction with what has traditionally been called higher education, or as I prefer to call it, post-secondary education, because I think a lot of us agree that the higher order skills aren't being taught anymore. When we talk about skills education as an integral part of post-secondary education, we're getting closer to taking a holistic view of education. It's not just baccalaureate programs. It's just not about the liberal arts. It's about having the skills to do the jobs this country needs done and the jobs people want to do to build a good life for themselves. I think we need to be a little more mindful when we talk about skills that we don't ignore the value of life skills. Let's talk about the traditional student for just a moment. There are increasing numbers of students who are older who have achieved some level of independence in their lives already before they ever consider post-secondary programs. But for just a moment, let's consider the 18-year-old freshman. I've counseled many in my day as an instructor, an advisor, and administrator. For many college freshmen, going into the post-secondary program they've chosen is their first taste of independence. I think we need to be extremely careful about limiting their exposure to the tough decisions an independent citizen has to make. Everyone here has heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating because it directly relates to what we're talking about today. It took me seven years to finish my baccalaureate program. That's because I was in the exact same position a lot of students are in today and some you described, especially older students, even though I started at 18. It took that long because the cost of college was very high even then. You may look at me and assume that I went to school so long ago that things are so different now, it's much more expensive now that I wouldn't understand. But I came from poverty most people in this room wouldn't understand. I didn't see running water inside a house until I was 14. So yes, college costs haven't changed, have changed, but the trappings of deep poverty haven't. In order to eat, in order to support myself, and alongside my husband, provide for our young family, I had to find a way to work while we were both in school. It was hard, but that's where we learned how to be adults. That's how we learned to make wise financial decisions. It's where we learned to differentiate between things we wanted 
and things we needed. Those are life skills. Those are what separate independent adults from people who want decisions made for them, from people who look to others for the answers. I empathize with working students probably more than anyone here. I didn't just walk in their shoes. For most of my career, I used my experience to give back to them, to offer whatever support and advice and mentorship I could. I think we need to be extremely careful in talking about working students or students who don't come to the table with means as welfare candidates. A few members have gotten close to that today. We don't need a, a, to view a period of government dependency as a rite of passage for Americans. We need to ensure certain services are reserved for those who have demonstrated they need them and keep post-secondary education a true learning experience for higher order skills, for job skills, and for life skills. We don't need to let institutions off the hook either. I've long said institutions need to be more responsive to the needs of the students they sign on to serve. What I've heard today from the witnesses is that there is a willingness, I believe an increasing willingness, willingness on the part of institutions to better serve the life needs of the students, the needs that, just, that aren't just academic. Good, good that you are stepping up. Let's see more institutions step up. Let's not give the government an excuse to put its hooks deeper into college campuses and student life by providing the services you should have been providing all along. When a student is admitted to an institution, it has to be a two-way agreement. The student commits to meeting academic standards and a steep financial commitment and the institution has a responsibility to help them. It's that simple. Thank you for coming again. Thank you all. And thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. I, I thank you very much. And again, thank you to the witnesses. I'll now recognize, recognize myself for the purpose of making a closing statement. And I want to acknowledge um, the, the ranking chair and my good friend, Virginia Fox, because I think we have worked hard on this committee to broaden what the public, what our students, um, what we see as higher education, and the fact that when people move on, whether it's through apprenticeship programs or through college programs, through university programs, they're all participating in that. And the payoff for our country is great. And that's what I think we've been trying to focus on, that it's important that we make sure that people complete, because when they do that, we all win. And when that doesn't happen, we know that the consequences can be great, not just for the individual, but for the generations of that individual's family and our community as a whole. The reality is that it is difficult for young people to complete college, all students, you know, uh, work hard at that, and depending upon whether they're non-traditional students or not. But we gain so much more when we're able to help support those students, psychosocial wraparound services, if you will, because when they complete, the payoff, as I've said earlier, is so much greater. It's great that everybody, you know, if we had everybody completing, but I think that's what really is at the heart of this discussion. So it's not so much about government services as much as providing the structure and providing the mentors. When you have people that are in your court and they are not going to make sure you're succeeding, it makes a big difference than if you're alone. Too many of our students are alone at a very, very difficult time. And that's what I think we, we work to do. And that's why um, Pell Grants are important. Without those Pell Grants, students could not be successful. But on the other hand, those other services have to be there for those students who need them. Fortunately, they all don't. But I can assure you, just like Mr. Ethabaugh Eth here, that you've been able to give back as a result of the support that you received. And there's no way of calculating that benefit to our community. So I'm gonna thank all of you for being here uh, today. We have to make certain uh, that college is affordable, access is there, but then making sure that people are able to complete. We have to work together to ensure that our higher education education system, support students through graduation so they can enjoy 
the life-changing benefits of a college degree, and that goes as well for other programs that they access in the course of their entire life and how they are learning. I want to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following letters on ways to improve college completion. Uh, a letter from Suzanne Ortega, president of the Council of Graduate Schools, and a letter from Can Chancellor uh, Loy Ortiz Oakley, Chancellor of the California Community College. If there's no further business, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you again.